One of the biggest reasons why people who grew up with trauma struggle to maintain good relationships is because of our own behaviors. Whether we want them to or not, we do things that push people away. I'm Anna Runkle, also known as the Crappy Childhood Fairy, and I teach people how to heal from the effects of abuse and neglect in childhood. I teach a lot about triggers, the way people and experiences can just totally dysregulate us and throw us off, neurologically, physically, and emotionally. Now, triggers are important, but what's also important are the ways that we act when we're feeling triggered or when we're triggered and don't even realize it, and we end up hurting or alienating other people. And this makes me so sad. It's why so many of us have suffered so much loss. And we've often gone through our lives longing for connection and not finding it, or alone and scared to even try anymore. And I'm here to say there is so much healing possible, and I can show you how. Because if you wanna change any negative pattern, everything depends on your ability to see and change, to find the little spots, where you have some power to change how your life turns out. And this can happen when you lovingly, courageously shift your focus from what happened to you to how you're handling life right now, when you have a choice in the question of what happens next. Okay, behavior number one that can push people away, our loneliness gets leaky. Loneliness is like the number one symptom of early trauma, and sometimes it spills out into the way that we relate to other people, and it makes us seem... I hate this word, but needy. Some ways that this can show up when we're first getting to know someone, we dominate the interaction with our stories and our feelings. So for friendship to blossom, there's got to be some give and take, talking, listening, talking, listening, caring about the other person and being genuinely interested in them. Here's another thing our loneliness makes us do. We sometimes confuse being open with other people with just you know, spilling our pain. Have you done that? If you're just getting to know someone and you're bringing out all your trauma stories, and let's face it, we have lots of trauma stories and they've kind of crowded out a lot of the other possible stories we could be telling. But if you're talking about that stuff, as soon as you meet someone, you might want to catch yourself and decide to just pull back and set aside the sad stuff and then measure it out in little increments over time. It's totally important to share this part of ourselves with people close to us, but unless it's an established relationship with someone who cares about the totality of you, you run the risk of overwhelming people or freaking them out. <laughs> I know I did. And then they close their hearts to you. It's just too much. Now, one exception to that is when you're talking to people who are very traumatized themselves or who are in an altered state from drugs or alcohol or who don't care what state you're in because they're trying to get something from you. So pouring your heart out in that situation might lead to a connection of a sort, but this is exactly how we so often end up entangled with inappropriate or destructive people. We get very intense. The people who can handle it are the very people who are not good for us to be around. So be measured. Little bits of your story shared over a slow time frame will help you start to build authentic friendships. Now, you might also be leaking your loneliness when you do too much of the initiating of get-togethers. You call them, you text them, you've got fun ideas they might enjoy, but it's always you doing the asking. Now, if you know someone who's been depressed and wants a little encouragement, there's no problem with doing this. But in an equal relationship where no one's trying to help the other person, it's better to allow for reciprocity. You invite them to get together, then wait for them to invite you. Maybe they'll happily surprise you and be right there with an invitation very soon after the last time you got together. Or maybe you won't hear from them for a while. When people don't make an effort to get together, that is information. It's good for you to know about what kind of a friendship they're interested in and what you can expect. Like, maybe not much of a friendship in that case, and definitely not a romantic relationship. So when one person doesn't pan out into a reciprocal friendship, it's just time to meet some extra people, some new people, not to keep pushing invitations on the same person. Okay, second behavior that pushes people away. We get overly other-focused. Do you know what I mean? We get very wrapped up in what the other person is thinking and feeling at the expense of what we are thinking and feeling. And this is one of those things where it always feels like no one should be able to tell that you're doing it because, hey, you're trying to be a good friend, right? 
But think about when people have done this to you, asking, how are you doing? Trying to read your mind, trying to fix problems that aren't even there. They're always kind of like pecking at you with this. It feels yucky, right? This is a classic fawning behavior. That's one of the major expressions of CPTSD, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And with fawning, it's like our whole beings get taken over by trying to read another person. And yes, this was a survival tool for a lot of us when we were little and trying to gauge our own safety in unsafe situations. But now the mode of behavior completely kills genuine connection. It's a form of being in our own heads, of not being present, of giving all our power to someone who has not even asked for our power. The relationships you want never require that you shut down or mentally flee the situation or give them all your power. And this is similar to another thing some of us do. When we feel rejected and hurt, but aggressively covered up by being cheerful, helpful, agreeable, no problem, this is what people who were abused as kids get way too good at. I call it crap fit. And I'll share a video with you about that at the end of this one. But going right into people pleasing when you're attacked, that's what it is. If someone's not treating you well, you can say something or you don't have to. And of course, you can always leave. But if some old hurt part of you responds to mistreatment by jumping in and doing a song and dance to show that, hey, you're not hurt, you're fine, you're cool. Is there anything you can do? This is not connection. This is you playing a role. And if this is familiar to you, ask yourself if that's something that you're doing with any people in your life right now. Real friendships never require taking crap or abandoning yourself as a means to cope. Real friendships are made of you being present. You are present. That presence is one of the most remarkable things that begins to show up. I love watching that with the people in my programs. So many positive changes flow from there. Okay, the third behavior that pushes people away. It's having a lack of clarity about when it's just you meaning you have trouble accurately seeing your own role in problems, either blaming yourself too much or denying any responsibility, or in fact, the thought that you play any role just like makes you angry. Have you dealt with people like that? Either way, black and white thinking, I'm totally responsible, I'm never responsible, it's a way of checking out of reality. And people who are not in reality are very hard to connect with. So some signs that you might be doing this include you apologize too much. Have you ever had someone do that to you? But for something they only imagine had offended you and you're saying, please, you don't need to apologize. But they keep doing it and they keep doing it and they feel so ashamed. And it's not a good feeling to be either person in that. So if you're profusely apologizing all the time, and key indicator here is that the other person keeps insisting that you don't need to or seems uncomfortable, let it go. Just let it go. The same goes for putting yourself down, saying, oh my gosh, I'm such an idiot. I look awful. I don't even belong here. You don't mean it this way, but it can come off like, like you're begging for something. What's really going on is you're drowning in fear, of course. And healing this, that's what I teach in all my courses. But telling everyone the contents of this like trash can in your mind, it just can be off-putting. Now, sometimes people who already have a trusting relationship might confess to each other the doubts they have about themselves. But blurting your fears out every time you make a mistake is consciously or unconsciously, it's an attempt to get other people to make you feel less fearful. They probably would help you if they could, but they can't. So it just makes things awkward. Now on the other side of the, is it just me syndrome are behaviors where we're oblivious to the fact when something really is our fault, which happens, right? And this shows up when someone says they're bothered by something we did and we skip over hearing it or caring how they feel and go right into defensiveness or even blaming them. Everybody knows what this feels like and absolutely no one likes it. Now it's true that sometimes people are gonna blame you unfairly for a problem, but the thing about having CPTSD is our judgment can be a bit slow or off, so it pays to listen. Now I'm not talking about listening to abusers here. That's a whole different thing when someone gaslights you or attacks you for imagined offenses and they can't be reasoned with. Those are not friends, okay? We get really fuzzy on determining, is this person's criticism right now something that I need to hear and take seriously? And the answer is, as a rule, yes. If you like and respect someone, it's only fair to hear what they have to say. 
Now, healing our childhood PTSD involves a balancing act between being open to hear things like criticism, but not instantly taking it inside our innermost heart and making it our truth. There's this place I call a front porch in our emotional world where we can listen and consider what we're hearing and take a moment to decide if we're going to let that inside our emotional home, our place of truth. Listening on the porch allows us to respond and responding. It's not the same as reacting, is it? Reacting is how we end up lashing out and running away from people. Responding means considering another person's feelings, showing courtesy, even when you don't see truth in what they're saying, not yet anyway, and making an effort to understand the spirit of what they're saying and responding to that. You don't have to fawn and grovel and you don't have to annihilate them. You can say, wow, I, I didn't realize you felt that way. Let me think about that and see if I can improve on that. Now notice all you said was that you'd think about it, that you'd see if you could improve. You didn't invalidate them. You didn't collapse emotionally, right? Sometimes during considerations, it's magical. The right words just come to you. So you can be real and tell the truth and still be a caring friend. Those two things, truth, and caring, that's what allows friendships to deepen. And that's how healing works. Little changes made over time. So don't give up. With small steps in your overall healing, you can learn to connect better. Better connecting, it's like jet fuel for your overall healing. So it's this positive cycle that just keeps getting better. One thing leads to another. Sounds good, doesn't it? The trauma reaction I want to talk about today is the trauma reaction where we attempt to control other people. And this can be very subtle because no one wants to see themselves as controlling, right? We know it's a bad thing, but sometimes we do it without realizing it. I've got a video from my archives. This is one of my favorites of all time, and it's about hidden control behaviors that push people away. See what you think. You know who likes it when people are controlling? Nobody. <laughs> Nobody likes people who are controlling. But when you grew up with trauma, there's this double problem that where you end up more likely to be entangled with people who are controlling and because people around you have so often been out of control, you end up being a controlling person. Now, big obvious forms of control are one thing, but I want to talk about the more subtle forms that control takes. You may not even know you're doing it, or you may not know it's being done to you. All right, so number one, a subtle form of control is outsourcing responsibility. So when people tell you that you have to not trigger them, they are outsourcing responsibility for their healing, right? They might get offended easily. They expect you to remember how sensitive they are about something they haven't healed yet. They make rules about what you can say, who can be invited to events, what food people can eat. All right, that's controlling. And what they're doing, instead of healing themselves and learning to have boundaries themselves, is they're making someone else responsible. So if you're the one doing that, if you feel that you are making excessive rules for people or trying to influence what they say or whether they trigger you, consider pulling that back taking that control back into yourself and learning to calm your own triggers. And you can set other people free to be themselves. They are more likely to feel great in your presence when that pressure is off of them. All right, the second one is what I call concern shaming. And this is a form of control where people are making little subtle criticisms at you uh, and expressing their doubts basically and how capable you are and your decisions and your actions. And they say, you know, I'm only raising my concern about this, you know, what you eat, what you do, where you work, where you're not working. I'm only raising this because I'm concerned about you. So for a parent to talk to a teenager that way might be appropriate. For peers and adults to talk to each other that way, it's not appropriate. And it's, 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 it's a form of shaming and it's passive aggressive and it's controlling. It's trying to influence another person to do what you think they need to do. Believing that you know how another person should live their life is by definition a form of arrogance. And when people get that energy of arrogance, it pushes them away. All right. So it's, it's a fine art sometimes of sitting back and admiring people and listening to them and supporting them without trying to influence how they live their life, unless they ask you. And if they ask you, that's another thing. All right. A third form of control in the subtle realm is 
People who avoid plans and schedules or they delay everything, they keep rebooking things, saying they're a free spirit or they're just really busy or they just forgot to reply or it must have gone into spam. And basically they're doing that as holding up you or a group from making a plan and carrying on with what they need to do. And that's a really common form of control. Um, it's not cool. <laughs> Sometimes people with, with complex PTSD end up being kind of they have hard, a hard time with calendars and schedules and remembering things because of dysregulation and I acknowledge that but if you're on the receiving end it ends up controlling your time so it's really understandable that it would push people away it, it, it's disappointing for them it's disrespectful to their time we all know what it feels like when people do it to us right so even though it could be something that's driven by your trauma it's something you can work on Another one is what I call controlling with time. And this could be where you cause people to wait all the time by being late for things 45 minutes all the time, or demanding that other people be on the dot or there's gonna be hell to pay. If you're their peer, it's not really your place to direct rage and control at them. If you don't like their habits of time, that's another discussion to have. But the controlling aspect of expecting people to meet your demands is one of those things that pushes people away. All right, another one. Controlling with mood, sulking. Everybody has to be quiet. Don't talk to me about your day because I had a bad day. Making you pay an emotional penalty for hurting them in the past, but not communicating directly and not allowing you any pathway towards resolving it. That is controlling with mood. And uh, people don't like it. And it eventually will sort of erode their spirit and push them away. Another form of control is controlling with expectations. <laughs> They're disappointed when you're not like who they imagined you to be, um, which is usually coincidentally how they are. And uh, I had a friend criticize me not that long ago who said, I, you know, I just really looked up to you. And what was happening is she saw me like struggling with something in my life and being confused. I was in tears. And it made her angry. She was angry. She goes, this is not who I see you as, you know. Don't you realize I look up to you? And that was a really hurtful thing to say. And I did end up not being friends with her. Good friends encourage and bless all of your efforts to be the best person you can. But they do not attack you for not being who they thought you were. Who they thought you were. And when people project on others, that's a CPTSD thing. That's often the consequence of rushing into a relationship, idealizing it, or it can be part of the sort of narcissist pattern of idealizing and devaluing. So those are all things I would call controlling with expectations. All right, another form of control is controlling with silence, the silent treatment, refusing to discuss something, walking out, you know, ignoring when somebody's talking to you. That is, that is a particularly aggressive kind of control. It's very hurtful to other people. And there are almost no situations where it's a good idea. If you really need to be not in contact with somebody, you can remove yourself. If you need to discuss something with somebody, you, it's time to show up for that conversation. If you feel it's not safe or a good time to have that discussion, you say that. You say, I want to discuss this. Right now I need to take a break until I feel a little more this way or until we're not angry at each other or until we have privacy. So showing up and being direct about that is the non-controlling way of setting that boundary, not being silent. All right, another form of control is controlling with sleep. Keeping people waiting because you're tired or you're sleeping. Um, the family's waiting for you. Let's say you're a parent and there's a plan today to go to the park and you unexpectedly decide to sleep in. The kids are running around and things are getting chaotic and the other parent is getting stressed out, but you're not getting out of bed. That's a form of control. Most people don't consider that, but it's controlling with sleep. All right, finally, trying to change people is a form of control. And this is a big blanket category. It's so natural to wanna to change people. And if you grew up with CPTSD, you're often gonna have in your life other people who have issues with trauma or self-defeating behaviors, and it's gonna mess things up for you. It's gonna be painful. This could be stuff like people who have problems with money or anger or drinking, and that's all real, and it might be hard to deal with, but there's a place where we enter into trying to control those people and make them change that becomes really toxic for ourselves and for them. 
So this is a much deeper subject, but if you find yourself having this idea of somebody who you care about, they would be so much better if they would just da da da. It's like we know better than to just like get in their face and go, you should change, I demand you change. We know that's not considered cool. But so then it comes out in these little subtle ways where you're just like, oh, you know, I heard about this book you might like and magically you bought it and you're pushing it under their face on the, at the dinner table or, um, you know, have you tried when somebody tells you they're struggling with a, a, an addiction or something, have you tried da da da? And just assuming that they're asking you for things as if they just said, you know, I don't know what to try. Could you possibly give me some examples of things I could try? Then you would say that. But offering these subtle little things of like pressure, pressure, pressure to change, it pushes people away. People are really remarkable and capable of making positive changes in their own lives without pressure on them. And a lot of how they do that, and I learned this through a lot of years um, checking out Al-Anon, which is a really great 12-step program for families of alcoholics. Um, and they, they taught me a lot about the experience of letting go of trying to change people and being wonderfully surprised at how they just went ahead and conducted their lives anyway. And it was better than it would have been with me pressuring them because there wasn't just all this friction pushing them away, making things tense, making them feel criticized, making them lash back out at me. I just let them be themselves and people, people will tend to, to work on themselves. Some people can't change right now. And sometimes the best thing you can do is to offer them love and acceptance and have some boundaries about what you can handle about the situation they're in, but not to keep putting pressure on them. When you are a loving and safe presence for people who struggle, you are more trustworthy and more likely to be the person they come to on the day that they want to say, Hey, I, I need some help. Could you give me some suggestions? And there you will be for them ready to go. Hi, Anna. I'm writing to ask for your advice on how to stop pushing love away. I've been dating the most amazing man I've ever met ever, <laughs> all caps. He's so kind and gentle spirited. We have had the hots for each other since I was 20 and he was 30. I'm now 44. So he's 54, okay? We have so much in common and being near him calms me so much in, in a way, but also causes extreme nervousness in my belly. When he's around, I feel zero desire to drink and almost no desire to smoke, both of which I abuse intensely when I'm alone. Here comes the fairy pencil. Okay, I'm circling that and these facts. This is, I, I circle things. I'm gonna read all the way through so I can hear where you're coming from, Larissa. And then I'll revisit some notes that I made here on the page, and I think I can help you. You write, I don't know if I have limerence or what the heck is wrong with me. I've broken up with him like 10 times in seven months. It's awful, but I can't seem to help it. These feelings are just too much. We're currently broken up, and my heart is so sad. I'm so frustrated and angry at myself. He still comes by my store. Seeing him melts my heart, and I just bawl after he leaves. I have to fix this, four exclamation points. He's emotionally scarred from a horrible marriage and even worse divorce where the mother of his children took him to court for the entire 18 years of his children's youth. So that even though he has a great job, he had very little money for himself all those years. Now his children are grown and he says he feels like he can date now. Before, he had, when he had no money and so much drama, he didn't think he would be, that it would be fair to anyone. I can tell he is as scared as I am. I was raised by an alcoholic mom and drug addicted dad. They divorced on my ninth birthday. My father left my mom for another woman who spent 30 years doing everything she could to keep us from my dad. So at nine, I became the caregiver of my brother who was a year younger because my mom had to work at a bar and grill. We spent a large part of our time at the bar because no one could watch us. So we turned chairs into beds since we usually didn't get home until three or four in the morning. I was then responsible for getting my brother and myself ready for school hours later and was screamed at if I failed to be on time. Lots more terrible things happened that I don't have room to write about, but I now know they had their own CPTSD. It's been easy to forgive them, at least I'm trying to anyway. Oh. I then entered a 14-year loveless marriage, divorced seven years ago, only to date men who turned out to be bums or kind of psycho. <laughs> bums are kind of psycho, yeah. I'm just laughing because it's just so true, right? Okay. 
been there. <laughs> One was textbook narcissistic personality disorder, which I didn't know existed until he had me so screwed up mentally. I thought I had literally lost my mind. I had to seek therapy and I've been ravenous for healing ever since. Woohoo. It was intensely painful. I think that that's where the fear of love is coming from. He was a liar, cheater, and manipulator. I'm still shocked. I could be so blind to it all. I love this letter. I know I have to stop drinking and have been trying. I've read Alan Carr's book and joined online communities, but it's been very hard. It feels hopeless at this point. I own a convenience store and sell liquor all day long. Selling the store doesn't feel like a great option at this point. My employees and customers are like family and we all rely on each other. They are my rocks. It's all I've done since I, I, since I was 20 years old. It's like home. Anyway, what are some things I can do to ease my fear of love? This man clearly loves me. I feel very much in love with him. He will not let me push him away. I think he's the one, but I want to be healthy mentally before we get too serious. Please help and thank you for your content. I'm learning so much, Larissa. <laughs> oh, and love and gratitude. Yeah, <laughs> what a friendly letter, thank you. Um, I love your predicament. I'm very happy for you. It seems like you have found love. And now the struggle part two begins is how do you deal with it? And um, yes, I know that one too. And there are things you can do. So it, it really jumps out. You grew up with an uh, alcoholic mom and drug addict uh, dad and your mom working in a, in a bar and grill to support you guys and having to bring you to work and sleeping on chairs and going home at three or four in the morning and then having to go to school. Oh, Larissa, I, I know what that's like, and um, that is so hard. And I'm proud of you because you own a store. You did take care of your brother. You pulled it together. You have a relationship. You know, it's, it's so understandable that you have these wounds right now that make it hard for you to kind of sit still and let love develop, right? so understandable, but you have so many things going for you. The big thing you don't have going for you right now is sobriety. And so um, I think you know, I learned the daily practice I teach everybody. I learned it from a sober alcoholic woman. I'm not an alcoholic, but I was my, almost my whole family is alcoholic. And um, you know, I, I, as far as I know, nobody's ever gotten sober. I, I don't know, we're like not even in touch. My family is so decimated by alcoholism and addiction. I don't even know what's going on with everybody. But I will say that the people that I've met in AA, like the woman who taught me how to recover and who I now pass on these techniques to everybody. I mean, hundreds of thousands of people are doing what we do now. That's what she taught me as how she got sober. She got sober in AA and she worked the steps a little differently than, you know, everybody. There's, there's many ways that people do AA. I noticed you didn't mention it. You mentioned Alan Carr. I know that he's well thought of, but it doesn't work for everybody. And the thing about AA is it's a community and, um, it's a community of people who have gotten sober. Uh, some of them are still struggling with it. Some of them have long-term sobriety and they can teach you how it's done. And everything that alcoholics tell me is that the only people that they would ever listen to is people who have actually experienced alcoholism themselves. And if, a, if somebody who had been a hopeless alcoholic and then became sober could tell them how they did it, that would be interesting to them. So I really recommend it to you. Um, I know people in my family have checked it out and decided it wasn't for them and then kept on drinking and they had their reasons, you know, like, I'm not like these people. I don't think, I think if you really, if you really want to step up and be ready for love, that destabilizing effect of like all that drinking, smoking less so, but smoking, you know, a lot of people who get sober, they first deal with the alcohol and later the cigarettes when they can. When I started, when I first learned these daily practice techniques and I had horrible PTSD, I got better very fast, but I kept smoking for about three years. I was a heavy smoker. After about three years, then finally I had something going on and, and a miracle occurred and I was able to stop because I was a big smoker. I get it. Smoking is re-regulating. It's a crappy form of re-regulation. It's not very good and it's, it gives you cancer and you know, you're not allowed to even do it inside. <laughs> but that's part of the charm, isn't it? You get to like go stand outside and take a few deep breaths. So we got to find other things to do. And so there is a place where you can get that comfort and ease that alcohol brings 
in an environment that does not involve alcohol. It involves wisdom about how to live without it. And a happier bunch of people I have never seen. It's a great group. There are meetings that are very sad and depressing. Don't go to those. Check around, go to different ones. It's the beautiful thing. I've always envied alcoholics because there's so many meetings. And um, you know, I'm somebody affected by family alcoholism. There are fewer meetings, <laughs> but there are meetings for us too. And you qualify for that. That's what they call in 12-step world a double winner. If you have alcoholism and you are affected by family alcoholism. But generally the wisdom is deal with the alcoholism first. Don't even worry about the other one. There, you're in, in, in any 12-step program, you're gonna be working the same 12 steps. I've been talking a lot about 12-step recovery and I just wanna to emphasize to anybody who checks it out, check out several meetings, get a sponsor and work the steps. If you've never worked the steps, you have never really done 12-step. I mean, literally, and it's, a, it's about working the steps. And meetings that are depressing and sad are usually because there's too high a proportion of people who don't work the 12-step program. They're just there to like talk about their pain. And while everybody needs to talk, that's the group is, what the group is for is to carry the message of hope. So it's also very socializing. You can make women friends, and I encourage you stick with the women, stick with the sober women, and learn from ones who seem to be able to have relationships themselves about how to do that. There's so much to learn about how to have a loving relationship. I had no idea. I used to think if I could just get married to a good guy, then I, it was just gonna be smooth sailing, but it, it wasn't. It was, there were some very bumpy years in the beginning, and I had the same thing. I just, I was really like, um, I don't know, like a, what's the word, skittish. Um, I would get upset easily. I would very easily feel that, oh, you don't love me enough. And all my old stuff was coming up and it was really hard for him to deal with. And luckily we had enough good things in there and had taken our time before getting married that we had a strong relationship that we got through that together and grew through it. And um, you know, every marriage has its ups and downs, but that's, that's okay, that's okay. I, what you say about this, the way he's very comforting to you, it's gone on for years. I love that, well, it, I guess it could be an avoidance logic, but if he didn't have work and he had a lot of drama in his life, that sounds very irresponsible not to date you, but to do it now because he's free. I kind of like that. That sounds mature to me. So, but you both, um, you both have been badly affected by trauma. You both are a little scared of intimacy. So here's some things that I would recommend to you. Don't move in. Have your own places. People who, you know, people who get all dysregulated and sort of triggered by intimacy, they need to be have a space they can go to. So it's not time yet to move in. First, spend some time, at least a couple years, being in a relationship, but not living together. All right. And then try not to get, I, I don't know what your tendency is. If you don't get too enmeshed, you don't have to run away so hard. So we call that titration. I have, you know, if you would become a member, Larissa that you could take all these courses, but I have one, it's about dysregulation. I have one about dating. I have one about connecting with people. The connecting one is all about, um, it's, it's all about like how to have better connections and deal with that difficulty connecting and sticking around with people and setting up boundaries and then opening our hearts. All of that is challenging for people who grew up with trauma. That's normal. So one of the lessons in there is called titration. And titration is a word borrowed from medicine and it means give a little at a time. So a way that you can date is like a couple times a week, you get together. When you talk on the phone, keep it to 30 minutes. Don't text all day. Have a couple of dates, have it be structured and have those dates end. Don't get sexual yet. Um, I don't know, maybe your relationship is already sexual, but that will often uh, trigger old trauma wounds before you're ready to handle them. You can do this the old fashioned slow way. Old fashioned works very well for traumatized people. Who knows, maybe they all had PTSD in the old days and they knew how to do this, but you go very slowly and you keep your life going. Now, I like that you have a store. Yes, you sell alcohol. I know of alcoholics who um, sell alcohol for a living and they're okay with it if they have sobriety. So that would be something to check with your AA group. But you have this family at work, I love that. You have friends to support you. It's not all coming from this one guy. But I, th I think it sounds like you guys might be called to be together. That's what it sounds like to me. I would get support around that. You've done therapy before. Do you need counseling now? Um, do you need to be part of a group of friends where there are couples where they know you and they can support you as individuals and just kind of be behind you? I think it, that really helps. 
that really helps. Being a couple who's isolated from everybody else, whose problems are private or secret or not known to anybody, that's a pretty hard path. But with support and um, being willing to share with other people what's really going on in your life, having people who you can safely, privately share. We had an argument last night. It was really hard. I felt like I needed to break up with him. I've promised him I wouldn't do that again. People who will support you through those moments. We're designed to function as a tribe. So we love, we, ha we have this person we love and our tribe supports each of us and it supports us as a couple. So set yourself up like that and go extra slow, double slow for people who were traumatized. And if you can, get that alcohol, um, get free of it, get free of it. Uh, I, think, I think if you would give AA a chance, you might just love it. What I'm talking about today is a strategy for you to be aware when your emotional reactions are taking hold of you and what you can say or do to handle those situations better, to express yourself when you need to, but take care not to push away the good people you appreciate and who you want in your life, okay? So the first emotional reaction that can push people away is that when we're hurt or disappointed, we disappear. And there are a couple ways we do this. One is we pretend we're fine when we're not fine. And then at some later date, we disappear. Or in some cases we act fine and disappear like all in the same, like five minutes. But either way, we're pushing people away. So let's take an example. All right, let's say that you and your friend have talked for years about taking a trip together to Mexico. And it was never a firm plan, but it was something that you'd been looking forward to and you assumed it would really happen. And you're eating lunch with your friend, just like you do every Thursday. And she tells you, hey, I've got exciting news. I'm gonna to go to Mexico with my new boyfriend. And it seems like she doesn't remember that you talked with her about that many times, right? Has that ever happened? So you end up saying, oh, great. <laughs> and you have a choice in that moment to tell her how you actually feel or because if you have childhood PTSD and you've had some painful experiences telling people when your feelings are hurt, then out of shame and fear, you might just go silent. You might hide, but either way, again, you're going to push them away. And so you feel like that's happening, right? You fear it and you try to prevent it. And so that's what disappearing is. It's an attempt not to damage the relationship, but unfortunately it's also going to push people away. But here's what disappearing looks like. You're boiling inside. She, you can't believe she would do this to you and pretend that she had no memory that you too had this loose plan, that you were gonna go to Mexico and you're fighting tears and your heart is pounding and these emotions are coming up. And somewhere inside, you know the plan, it wasn't firm and she's probably innocent, but there's this other part of you that's about to slide from sad and feeling kind of sucker punched by this news to angry and mean. Fight response, right? <laughs> Disappear is flight. This is the fight response. And of course, you know what always happens when the mean part comes out. So you don't want to be mean, so you just stay silent. That's freeze, right? And you just sit in awkward silence with your friend or you fill the silence with chit chat. That could be fawning, right? Right? But actually you're not there. You're so far away. You're so far, you're gone. <laughs> and as soon as you can get out of the lunch, you find an excuse, you get yourself out of there and you say, bye, really nice. But then comes the long silence, right? Where you avoid, where you ghost them. And when Thursday rolls around again, you tell her, oh, you know, I'm busy. And the next week she texts you to see if you still want to meet up and have lunch and you ignore her text this time. And the whole time you're thinking, I should just respond. I should just go. I should quit making such a big deal out of this. I'm going to regret this. I got to tell her how I feel. But the later it gets that you haven't answered that text, the weirder you feel that it's going to be when you actually do respond or get together. And that's where the temptation comes to just really flee, to really blow the whole thing off. And now you've really pushed her away. And it might be recoverable, but your friend feels hurt now. So even worse, if she calls you the next day to find out what happened, you don't want to take her call. You don't want to hear how she's hurt. You don't know what to say. Or it's worse than that. You do pick up the phone and this time you do the, the second CPTSD emotional reaction that pushes people away and you release a whole boatload of anger on her. Fight. You start out with a 
with I statements and feeling words. You go, well, I just, you know, I just feel like we talked about this, right? But then the conversation just rolls over a couple of logs there and next thing you know you're blowing up you're going into accusations and yelling and talking on top of each other you were hurt she was hurt and then you tried to disappear your feelings so hard that what happened is it came out of you like lava all right and you say hurtful things unfair things things you know are only going to damage the relationship but it just seems in those moments there's only going to be relief if you can get them said if you can convince her how hurtful she was and you know, she might've been realizing she was inconsiderate by forgetting your plans, but now she just wants to get away. And that wasn't the outcome you wanted. Okay, so let's unpack what just happened here. You were hurt, you tried to disappear instead of talking to her, and then you tried to use anger to get her to recognize your feelings. But all you've got now is someone who wants to put up a wall against you. And she definitely doesn't want to take that trip with you now, right? But if you have a pretty good friendship, then one of you sooner or later is going to try to talk things through. And it might even be you who starts it, which I would give you a gold star for. If you're still in the emotional reaction of it, then when you get together for lunch again, even if you start out with kind words and taking responsibility, you're gonna end up doing the third thing that pushes friends away. And that's when your expectations of other people to care about your feelings becomes child-sized. And when I say child-sized, I don't mean like this, I mean like this, which is to say enormous. We have these child expectations. And again, this is not your fault. If you were emotionally neglected by your parents when you were little, it is so normal to have these huge outsized ex expectations from friends and partners later on. There's just this big neglected, you know, empty space inside. And so when something hurts you there, when people make you feel overlooked or excluded, what they get from you is hit with expectations that you rightfully had as a child, but are th that are totally inappropriate now that you're an adult and you're laying it on them. And that doesn't feel good for them. Now, as a child, you needed to feel important and treasured and central to your parents' lives. But with adult friends, there's a time to step aside for them, to have other relationships, to go to Mexico with who they want to go with. And it isn't always going to be with you. Now, when you were a kid, if you had to suppress those feelings of abandonment and just soldier on, it has a way of making you kind of squirrely around plans and inclusion, you know? So your friend taking the trip you wanted to take with her with someone else, which is okay. It's not like you had dates set. It's not like you had tickets. That would be another story. It triggers a lifetime of pain in you though. It all comes roaring back in your nervous system. You might not even be conscious. You're just feeling awful. You're sad. You were supposed to be cared for. It's so understandable why feeling left out now is intense. But the thing is for friends, these expectations, and you know this was part of yourself, even, even when the emotions are spilling out and sabotaging everything, these expectations are unreasonable. To your friend, it feels like bullying or it feels like you're crazy. And that's how we push people away. You know that up here, you can see that a rift is coming, but down here in your heart, it's like a desperate little kid is driving. It's, it's being a kid all over again. It feels in those moments like there's no way to talk it through. There's no good outcome. And the temptation then is to do the fourth CPTSD thing, and that is to vilify your friend, to justify all the struggles you have with handling the feelings or expressing them or working them out, but just writing her off as a bad person. And we do this in a hundred ways, right? You're arrogant. You have no idea what other people go through. You're a narcissist. <laughs> your boyfriend sucks. And okay, we could go on and on. We point the hurt out here rather than feeling it in here and working on it here. And that's how we do the fifth CPTSD thing where our pain causes us to not be able to see people. It sucks us into ourselves. We can't see people. And you know, if you're going to have a good friendship, half of that is you being a good friend. And one key property of good friends is that they are capable of feeling happy for their friend when something good happens. We can't be in some mental mathematical model where any happiness they have with someone else is an insult or, or it robs us of, of our due with them. And I chose the example of this vacation that, you know, it's sort of vague, a vaguely planned vacation. And then 
it was forgotten by the friend with the new boyfriend. And I chose this example because that is inconsiderate and it does hurt, but it's the kind of thing that happens all the time between friends. They don't owe us the care that a parent owes to a child and they can't actually cheat on us because there's no such promise like there would be in a committed romantic relationship. And yet we react like this sort of thing is happening. A friend is someone you support, who you want the best for, and for whom you give forbearance. You give them a little space to make mistakes or, or to have a misunderstanding. You would never want to, to force anyone to take a trip with you, right? It wouldn't be friendship. It wouldn't even be fun. I've been on trips like that. And so the solution in this situation is to be a person who has several friends, who's not relying on one person to be your everything. That way you can take responsibility that you have a dream, you wanna take a trip, and if it's not this person, maybe you'll try that person. Maybe you'll go by yourself. But you're not gonna put responsibility for your happiness on your friend. Now, was she disappointing? Yes. So here's what you might've done earlier in all this, back at that first lunch where she first told you that she was going to Mexico, all right? So your friend says, guess what? New boyfriend and I are going to Mexico, okay? So just like before, you get a strong emotional reaction and you grew up in abused and neglected, so that's gonna happen, okay? But here's what you might say, oh my gosh, that's so great. You must be so excited. Now you're, you're expressing that you want the best for her even though you're not feeling it right now. And then you can say, you know, I have to admit, <laughs> I'm having a bit of an emotional reaction about it right now and I'm, I'm totally happy for you, but for me, I'm kind of crushed. I don't know if you remember, but you and I talked about a trip to Mexico. Do you remember that? And then your friend might go, oh yeah. She probably knew, right? She probably did remember all along. But she go, oh yeah, well, I didn't know we had an actual plan. All right, now that's fair, right? And then even if you still feel all your strong emotions, you can speak out of your highest values and know that the way your feelings are gonna come back to earth later is gonna go better if you can be true to your values now while they're just going crazy. You're not acting directly on your intense feelings. You're acting on your values, that you wanna be fair, that you wanna be level-headed, that you're gonna give yourself time to think about things, to see what you need to express if you need to. It doesn't ever have to be like in this minute. I do think there's a lot to be said for speaking up in the moment. But sometimes as people with childhood PTSD, we need time to kind of think this through. Um, maybe use our tools to calm the triggers down. Maybe check in with, you, with a mentor or a coach or a friend, kind of go, am I being unreasonable here? So in this case, I would just say, you know, I've created an example where it's hurtful, but the right thing to do is to give her your blessing because you can't force her on the trip. And if you want to stay friends, you got to find a way to work with this and be an independent spirit who has several people you could make such a plan with or do it by yourself. Okay, so this is a friend you care about, you want her in your life. And so something you could say is, the way that I feel so bad about this makes me see that I really need a vacation and I'm gonna take some time to figure out how I can do that. It sounds really fun what you're doing. I hope you have a great time. And there it is, it's really graceful. You've been honest, you haven't suppressed your feelings, you haven't squished it down and tried to you know, obliterate yourself in order to be accepted by somebody. You've said how you feel. You've also been gracious and loving. My letter today, I, I really felt for this woman. Um, I'll call her Chelsea. And she writes, I'm writing to you to ask your opinion on something, Anna. In the time in which I was very slowly waking up and then healing and recovering from CPTSD, although mostly before I saw what was going on, I behaved badly in a few situations. Here in the South, we would say, I showed my ass. <laughs> the situations in question were times where someone else was acting really unfair or cruel or nasty to me, and instead of walking away, I just kind of let loose all my emotions back onto them. I've been there. All right, I'm gonna circle some things. I'll read all the way through so we can kind of hear the whole story, and then we'll go back and I'll talk about some of the things I circled and see if I can help you, Chelsea. Okay. One example, she says, is when I joined a neighborhood group online. Uh-oh, neighborhood groups online. I know how this goes. When I got there, I saw a long discussion thread of a few of my neighbors talking badly about me. <laughs> neighbors, okay. Um, and it was based on some assumptions that weren't true. A friend of mine 
had let his dogs out off the leash when I wasn't home, which I had told him specifically not to do, and the dog chased the neighbor's cat and was generally a menace. I had animal control called to my house to investigate my own dog, lots of calls, and legal liability because it was my house. I ended my friendship with that person and told them they could not come over or bring their dogs anymore. The basic online version of the story was that I knew all about it, condoned it, and didn't care what happened to my neighbors. So they were raking me over the coals. Oh yeah, okay. Rather than just unsubscribing from the group, closing my computer and walking away, I called the neighbors out in the comment thread. Of course, this never ever helps the situation. And in my rant, I mentioned that one of these neighbors months before had been really rude and snubbed me when I waved hello to her at a grocery store. <laughs> this is heating up, it's heating up here. And it cleared up the mystery as well as to why various people in the neighborhood wouldn't smile or wave or say hello back to me when I saw them while out for a walk. So after I made the post, she saw me in the store and she made a big sarcastic show of saying, hello. Uh, what I saw in the group was hurtful and unfair, but my retaliation was harsh and unnecessary. There you go. I don't remember the exact contents of what I said, but it's very possible or likely that I made assumptions that exaggerated their intentions to hurt me, similar to what they had done to me. Ooh, you have insight, girl. Okay. They were probably just rightfully angry about the dogs being loose and endangering other pets, which makes sense. Pulling me apart on a public forum probably wasn't the best thing they could have done, but then that's where I blew up at them as well. All right. Of course, since then, my neighbors won't talk to me or look at me. Not that they really did before, either. The dog incident was what they were complaining about online, but they had been snubbing me before that for reasons I don't fully understand. They were friendly with my ex-husband who smeared me after I left our abusive marriage, so that could have something to do with it. I'm torn about whether I should make any kind of apology. I often feel like I should just try to let it go and keep doing the daily practice. That's the techniques I teach. Yay for you doing that. Um, and you say doing it because the feeling of having to do something does lessen as you continue with the practice, which makes you think that it might be part of some of the compulsive nature of CPTSD flashbacks. Oh, the yelling. Yeah, right. Okay. And I chalk it up to the lessons learned and whether I should make one simple and direct apology as I do feel I shouldn't have posted what I posted. But then again, neither should they. <laughs> I get very mixed up in general when I have wronged someone who also wronged me, who, who I think may be an unsafe person. When before my recovery, I wouldn't have defended myself against this kind of treatment, but would have just cried and fawned and begged them to explain why I was bad and forgive me. Uh-huh. I'm not sure how good a judge I am of exactly how the fault lay in these types of situations since I was super triggered when the events happened. For example, was the discussion about me in the online group really as negative as I remember? I don't even know. Oh. It doesn't feel right to just do nothing. If someone had acted crazy at me, I would appreciate an acknowledgement and an apology as long as it was simple and not in my face demanding a response or anything. Then again, I've never gone after a neighbor and torn them apart in front of many others while they weren't there to defend themselves. What do you think about making amends to people who treated us badly as well? Does it make me just as bad as them if I don't acknowledge or apologize? Is it keeping myself safe to not approach them or is it cowardly? If I apologize and they just take it as another springboard to torch me with more accusations and insults, then does that make me foolish for trying? Every time I think I've made up my mind, a week goes by and then I'm right back at the beginning of the question again. Would love to hear your thoughts, Chelsea. Okay, I can help you with this. This is, <laughs> I actually have specific experience with horrible neighbors making up stuff. And um, yeah, it, it's been shocking. And I went through the cycles you did of like, you know, can I fawn? Can I bargain with them? Can I try to understand where their pain is coming from? But it, it turned out they were just being nasty. And it was um, mostly, um, you know, I hate to say it, but women like mean girls, you know, who get together and do that. And I guess there's been a few instances in my life where that's happened. And when I look back at it and think about in retrospect, how I could have handled it, that's how I'm going to tell you to do it. And I, I actually, 
I, I'm going to say, yes, you can apologize. It's an option for you. And I'll tell you why, and I'll tell you how, but let's go through this letter. This is so juicy, Chelsea. It's just, <laughs> it's such a drama, right? So I love that phrase. I showed my ass. Yeah. So you blew up at people for mistreating you. They, I, I don't blame you. Um, people talking smack about you online is pretty bad behavior. So this thing happened with the dog. It wasn't actually your fault. They blamed you. You didn't have a chance to explain yourself. You don't know why people are not talking to you. I think this thing that you split up in an abusive relationship and your husband smeared you and women can't handle it, I think it's significant. And I can only speculate, but I will tell you that when I became divorced, my relationships with the women who I had normally hung around with and specifically in my neighborhood became strained. And I don't know what that's about. I, I don't know what it's about. You know, I sometimes wondered, it's like, what, do you think I'm a threat or, or does it scare them to see somebody else going through what they fear most of being on their own and not being able to manage? I don't know, but it happened to me and it hurt so bad because like when you go through a divorce, you kind of need more social support, not less. So there was this shaming and I'll just, I'll just tell you, like it, it reached a crescendo where there was this gossip that went around where people, <laughs> I had inquired about, um, adopting a cat long after I left that neighborhood and uh, somebody they there were like mutual friends and somebody from the neighborhood told them that I killed cats that I I had killed four cats in fact and you shouldn't like let me have a kitten <laughs> and it's just totally not true um and I I think it has to do it just has to do with this weird like attitude of judgment and negativity I had a little kitten up there I still have her she's actually sleeping at my feet right now she's 11 years old I had a kitten in that neighborhood and somebody just got really codependent and they're like, I think you're not taking care of that cat. And I was, I was totally taking care of the cat. I had had a cat for 15 years before that, that died of a natural causes cat disease. And, um, so I don't know where they got this idea. It was just like a game of telephone gossip that just went viral. And soon all these people were giving me weird and dirty looks and it wasn't true and it wasn't worth defending myself. It's like, can you imagine if I just was going to call everybody up and go, excuse me, I just want to tell you, I had a cat, it died of old age, and then I got a kitten, and I still have that kitten, and I didn't kill any cats. <laughs> it's just, like, it just would be so dumb to even try to fight it. Honestly, what I did, I eventually moved out of that neighborhood, and with gusto. I was so glad to be out of there, and my life got totally better simply by moving away. There was something toxic in that whole scene. There was a lot of drinking a lot of gossipy stuff. I don't know. It just wasn't good. So when you talk about this neighborhood, I can't help but go, oh gosh, it sounds like my old neighborhood. And it sounds like some sort of real housewives show or something where these people have nothing better to do than get online and gossip like everybody knows. Can I just tell you, don't gossip about people. Don't try to slander anybody's reputation, you know, ever. Just don't do it. And um, you know that. So I all of this is just to say, I totally understand the pain, the confusion. How do you, you know, how do you fight something like this without just making everything worse? I do, I, I'll tell you how to do it. I, I know what to do and you can follow my advice if you want. You didn't walk away, you yelled at them. You, you got into a rant online. <laughs> I don't know, Chelsea, sometimes I think people have it coming, but yes, it, it ends up kind of harming you. And it's, you know what the biggest thing is? You don't have peace about it right now. You don't have peace about it right now. But I'll tell you a little secret belief that I have is that for those of us who have been suppressed, not listened to, not supported emotionally as kids, sometimes when we're upset and we need to express ourselves now, it is better to express ourselves badly than not to express ourselves at all. So I'm sort of behind you on this. I think you can clean up anything that you don't like about how you handled it, but good for you for speaking up. For your spirit with your CPTSD to just go, you know what? You don't get to treat me this way. Good. Every cell of your body hears it when you do that. All right? So good. You did it. All right. But it's messy. Now you're embarrassed and you're not having peace. So let's, let's undo the part, that, the part that needs to be undone. Not the part that you spoke up. You stood up for yourself. Oh, people who ostracize, like, that is such a cruel punishment. It's a terrible thing to do to people. Um, and you think like, what is this high school? But it, it is, it's like, yeah, it is. It is like high school and people who are immature do it to other people. Who knows? I don't know. They get some sort of feeling of being good people out of it or something they don't want to look at. I don't know. We can only speculate and it's 
It's a waste of time to speculate. We just got to get peace inside. All right. So I love your insight. You have very good insight where you say, I, it's very possible I made assumptions that exaggerated their intentions to harm you. That is what we do. So that's brilliant. Let's assume that you did, all right, as we consider a possibility. Let's just consider. So um, they also, it's yes, you maybe did that. They did it. They thought that you had intentions to harm them when they assumed you didn't care about this dog thing, which you did. You responded to it in the best way you could, and you did care. So they're probably just rightfully angry about the dogs being loose and endangering other pets, which makes sense. Um, but pulling you apart on a public forum probably wasn't the best thing. That's putting it nicely. It's, it's BS. You know, that's terrible doing that. Um, people should talk directly when they have a, a beef with somebody. Absolutely. This thing where people use the internet for it is just, it's made life terrible for everybody. All right. So that's when you blew up with them. So, of course, you say, then my neighbors won't, wouldn't talk to me or look at me. Not that they really did before, either. The dog incident was what they were complaining about. But they'd been doing this for a long time. And you don't even know why. I'm sorry. That's terrible. That is cruel human treatment. Okay. They were friendly with your ex who smeared you after you left your abusive marriage. Yeah. Says a lot about the people. I don't know. So, that could have had something to do with it. Um, but I think sometimes like something really bad happening, like if they're aware that you're abused, people who are not emotionally mature, they're just like, oh, I can't deal with that possibility. You know, maybe they have something like that in their life or they're afraid of it. Or again, I think that people carry fear and they see somebody like standing up for themselves or getting free. And it's almost like they stand in front of you, they feel scared. And because they're not very grown up inside, they think you're the one making them feel afraid. They conflate you with the threat that they dread that your experience represents, you know, because it can happen to anybody and it will happen to some of them, right? And they know it. They know it on some level. I often feel like I should just try to let go, do the daily practice, yes. Chalk it up to lessons learned. Well, I think if you could let it go, you would have by now. And that's one reason why a good apology is so powerful because it lets you let it go. Like you just kind of, you know, when you know that you, that even though they, they were worse, you did something wrong. The fact that you did something wrong is what's haunting you. It's less so. The fact that they did something wrong is easy to forget. You will forget it. But this part where you feel like you didn't live up to your own standards, that's what's grinding you down. Okay. So <laughs> you posted it and... You get mixed up in general when someone has wronged you and then you wrong them back and, you know, are you bad? Or are you just as bad as them? And it's confusing. Yes, it is. It is. And then the fear that if you apologize that you're either condoning or you're, you're accepting guilt that it's all your fault or that you're condoning their treatment of you. So here's what I want to say. Apologizing does not have to be that at all. You don't have to go there. So here's how you make a clean apology to them if you decide to. You cannot, you know, like it's up to you, but you might as well give it a try. It's good practice. You have to detach from things turning out a certain way as a result of your apology. So first you detach from that and you go, I'm just going to own what I did. I'm going to say it directly to these people. And so um, I don't know how you would do that. You're talking about a group of people. You don't want to put it online. If it's a direct um, conversation with them or you see them standing together or you go talk to a couple of them and then a couple more when you see them. And so you prepare this, you do a little preparation work and you go, hey, I just wanted to apologize for how I blew up at you online. Um, and you don't bring up anything they did, not even a little bit. That's the temptation, right? I want to apologize for how I did that. But you, da, 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 that's how we instinctively do it. But now you're going to do it in a, in a better way, which is don't bring up their part. That is for them to do. Just say, I'm sorry for how I blew up at you online. I realize that I may have assumed worse motives than you had. And I'm sorry. Uh, if that had happened to me, I would have been embarrassed, um, you know, for people to see that online. Um, I, hope, I hope we can work it out. That's all you have to say. You may not even want to work it out, so you don't have to say that if you want. But the key thing there is to just admit really plainly and honestly, this is what I did. This is how I would feel if it were done to me. I'm sorry. I would like us, this to be resolved and worked out. Or just, I'm sorry. You can say, I hope you can forgive me. And you leave it at that. And I'm just going to tell you in my experience, probably they are not going to apologize for what they did. So just be ready for that. You don't care. You don't need their apology, right? You just need to have peace inside because you know who you are. You know what you're doing. You know what they did is wrong.
right? You don't know how bad it was, but your goal in life is to start getting a grip on this PTSD reaction where you flip out on people. And I don't say that as judgment at you. I say that as somebody who has done it before too. And it feels terrible. I mean, the shame is awful when you flipped out on somebody, right? I know. And so you're practicing giving that good apology and then just stepping back and letting the chips fall where they may. I don't think it's very likely to give, create an opening for them to come complaining at you. But if they do, all you do is go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay, okay, I hear you. Yep, I'll take that into consideration if they did that. But I'll tell you what, I, um, I've had to make some pretty scary apologies to people for things worse than what you did. And the worst thing that's ever happened is people just were indifferent. They were like, oh, whatever, okay. And it didn't change our relationship and it doesn't need to. It did feel good to just like say, I'm sorry I did that. Because I was ashamed. I was ashamed about how I acted. And I needed to like just take responsibility for that and clean up my mess. Just take a little broom and go there. It's no longer lying around. It doesn't change what they did. But you're learning by this to have boundaries and you feeling more confident that you can cope with and take responsibility for your part in things is going to empower you next time somebody mistreats you to stand up to them in an elegant way, in a pointed way, in a way that does defend yourself or ask questions or has a conversation or patches things up as the case may be that you feel is the appropriate outcome. But you're no longer a prisoner of your own PTSD reactions. That's what you're teaching yourself to do. So I don't know what's going to happen with them. I'd like to hear. You're not foolish for trying. You're actually highly evolved. We have a saying in my house, first one to apologize wins. That's, that's the rule. <laughs> that's how it works. The person who knows how to apologize quickly has great emotional maturity and, and fluidity and choices in life. People who had a rough childhood often go through life feeling or knowing that they are a little different than most people. And it's common sense that early exposure to violence, addiction, abuse, or neglect can have a lifelong effect on mental health and behavior. And until recently, researchers understood these effects to be mostly psychological or learned from dysfunctional parents. And while this is partly true, we now know the primary injury is neurological. Early trauma dysregulates the brain and nervous system, potentially triggering a whole range of problems from obesity to ADHD to heart disease to sex addiction. But for people with childhood PTSD, just being dysregulated is a problem that makes ordinary things in life ridiculously hard. Things like going on a date, spending time alone, expressing an opinion, or just buying a pair of shoes can completely set it off. If you could see an MRI image of the brain in this dysregulated state, you'd see that the front left cortex goes dim and inactive, hampering the ability to reason and pay attention. And you'd see the right front cortex flaring wildly, which is a flood of emotions. So suppressed reasoning, overactive emotions. Is this familiar? It is not all in your mind, it turns out. It's in your brain. So there's this change of activity. Brain waves are irregular, breathing and heart rate become ragged and out of sync, and there may be numbness in your hands, your mouth, your face. It could be hard to find words or to complete something you're doing. It would be hard to pay attention. Personally, I get clumsy and I trip on curbs and drop things. My handwriting changes when I'm dysregulated. For a lot of us, we say things in this dysregulated state that we don't mean, and we do things that we didn't really want to do. Or we may grow silent and withdrawn, or we may feel desperate and act impulsively, or fly into a rage and lash out at people. And after an outburst, we may feel almost no emotion and behave coldly to people we've just hurt. My friend told me that when I'm upset, I have a blank expression on my face. And so it's impossible to tell from the outside what I'm feeling. It looks like I don't care. And I remember a teacher telling me when my son was in preschool that he'd been really naughty that day. And I was mortified and freaked out what I was going to do about it. And she said, I'm telling you this and you obviously don't care. Well, I finally have some insight about why she would say that, why people have ever thought that about me. I do care. It can be so hard to navigate life when your face is telling people one thing and your feelings are in another place. But here's the thing. These reactions are not happening because I'm bad or because anybody else is necessarily bad or selfish or weak. Okay, maybe 
there is always some weakness in people, but these reactions are happening or they're made worse because the brain is dysregulated. Nobody knew this before, not doctors, not therapists, not preschool teachers, nobody knew, but now we know. One way that I've described the feeling of dysregulation to people who have never really experienced it is that it's like wearing a pair of headphones with ACDC music just blasting in your ears. And it's like you're wearing somebody else's glasses that make everything blurry. And when it's really bad, it's, it's like you're wearing this giant pair of clown shoes that are a foot too long for your feet. <laughs> you get the picture. You just kind of like not in sync with the physical environment. You look normal. Nobody can see this is going on. And you have to pretend that you're fine and that you're in the conversation, but you feel disconnected and uncomfortable. And you, and, and you find yourself guessing like what a connected person would say. You have to think about how to hold your face so it looks appropriate to whatever the other person is saying. Only you can't really hear what they're saying because that noise in your head is so loud. Dysregulation gets activated when we're confronted with stressors and crises. And remember, it can suppress your ability to reason and at the same time amp up your emotions. So you see how this explains so much why those of us with childhood PTSD appear to keep making the same bad choices over and over, even when we say we're never going to do it again, even when we mean we're never going to do it again. And then you look at yourself and you're doing it again. And I'm here to tell you, you can break this cycle. You're really capable of making good choices and good changes, but not until you learn to re-regulate. So the solution comes in two phases. First, learn to re-regulate and stay regulated. And then with your nice, fresh, regulated mind, work on the behaviors and circumstances that flowed out of you living your life dysregulated for so many years. The childhood trauma happened and we definitely were affected. But this stuff, this way that we have ended up living because of being dysregulated all the time, this is what's holding us back now. The dysregulation and the self-defeating behaviors. So that's the essence of what I teach in my courses and coaching. Learn to re-regulate your brain and emotions, and I teach people how to do that. Acknowledge what happened, and then put it over on the side so that you can stop dwelling on it and stop identifying with it. And then move your focus to healing the things you do that are holding you back today. Focus on right now what you're doing to make your life happy. And that's how you become your real self. It is time to be your real self. The past can't actually touch you now. It's time to be yourself in all your beautiful, funky glory. You are a work in progress. And if you can master re-regulation, you have all this space in your life and possibility. You can meet people and try things and quit things and get away from people if you need to. These all become choices when you learn to re-regulate. You can go back to school. You can try your hand at romance. You can tell your story without flying out of your body and collapsing into a crying mess every time. You can choose what you want to spend time thinking about. Can you imagine doing that? It's really nice. There's this idea out there that to heal from trauma, you need to feel your feelings. And some people will encourage you to feel your feelings and explore your feelings and trust your feelings. But when you have PTSD from childhood, the problem isn't always that you don't feel what you're supposed to feel. More of the time, I think the problem is that you do feel your feelings too much. They get overloaded. And I can show you how to reel that back into a healthy balance. It's called emotional dysregulation. And in my opinion, it can do even more damage than being out of touch with your feelings. Your life can get dominated by your emotions. Are you familiar with that feeling? Your relationships get dominated by your emotions. Your career gets dominated by your emotions. And being so emotional, like having feelings that are inappropriately intense by most people's standards, or when you get emotional at inappropriate times, that's not something where feeling your feelings is the solution. In my view, emotional dysregulation really is kind of like a wrecking ball or like a tornado that spins around and wrecks everything in its path. Where's it going to go? You don't know. It just sort of comes up out of nowhere and boom, starts destroying things. Sometimes emotional dysregulation goes in the opposite direction and it just sort of like, like it's like a light bulb, you know, where all of a sudden it glows really brightly and then goes out. 
it's dark there's nothing you're not feeling anything blazing light nothing with complex PTSD what is often a symptom of emotional dysregulation is that flatness after a big outburst so you might be familiar with some of those patterns feelings go out of control they're coming out in bursts they're out of proportion to what's going on or at an inappropriate time like crying at work or having an angry outburst at your internet provider when you're on a customer service call and it also refers to going flat emotionally so it's dysregulated it's, it's just like not kind of in the middle area that would be appropriate or normal or comfortable for human communication so big spikes nothing but either way when your feelings are dysregulated you might say and do things that are that only overwhelm you further and then that actually create new traumas that make your situation even harder than it was so it can be a vicious circle so one example could be having an argument with your partner so let's say something makes you angry and they forgot you had friends coming to dinner and you cooked but your partner arrived an hour late you didn't know where they were they never called and the guests arrived and you didn't have an answer for them and you called your partner three or four times and you texted and you called and you were getting more and more frantic you're in the other room to try to hide how angry you are and the friends are there and you're trying to act normal and like everything's fine and it's no big deal that your partner's not there and then an hour into the dinner your partner walks in they totally forgot and they see everyone and they remember oh my gosh they're so sorry and they're embarrassed and the guests are like it's fine it's fine and you're like where were you and you're trying to act normal you're trying to keep your emotions kind of in the bandwidth of not totally awful for the guests but you can't and so they're ready to sit down now and enjoy the company but for you it's too late that's emotional dysregulation at work because old feelings of being ignored and abandoned are just exploding up out of the past it you know it is an offense that your partner forgot that's not cool but the intensity that's coming out of you has more to do with the past it's you know it because it's like filling up your chest it's in your gut it's in your head you might start getting a headache and the guests are there so don't you hate that getting emotionally dysregulated in front of company it's your reaction to the situation that's now ruining the evening has this happened to you in the moment it feels like these huge emotions are the only feelings a person could have and now later you're going to have the insight that your reaction was actually too much that you became the problem person of the evening but when it's happening it just feels real it feels necessary to be that angry right it's moments like this when maybe you've said things you didn't mean because now you're not just dealing with disappointment and hurt but you're believing that nothing's any good because you know what's driving you at that point shame you see the old shame of like that old well of anger and emotion came up and kind of blasted out there's like this point where you know it's feeling really real and you get so mad and then it blasts out of you and that often sort of triggers you to start recovering and coming back to reality from like wait it's not really that bad so then the shame comes in and you feel worse then you might feel a need to check out you go flat you can't apologize you know everything well this is how friendships fall apart this kind of thing is how it falls apart and it's not your fault you got this way this is a really common and normal response to having grown up with trauma but of course we all want to work on it and learn to handle it even better even if your partner is used to this kind of behavior and they stick around this kind of conflict that doesn't feel realistic that feels overblown it'll gradually drain away love and trust and close off connection that otherwise would be getting deeper and getting sweeter over time so that's another way relationships get destroyed so this is what I mean when I sort of give the side eye to the idea that what we all need is just to feel our feelings or you just need to grieve or you just need to get in touch with your anger like that's not always the best advice for everybody it's not always what's needed for some people with CPTSD what's needed is to self-regulate and get more control over emotions and to have some tools in your tool belt to know how to do that on the spot even before you really know what's going on with you even before you've been able to process or talk through what happened just when you realize like uh oh I'm going over the top how do you pull yourself back because that's how you can make a positive change for the better once you can manage that you start having a huge amount of space where you can you can talk things out you can ask questions you can express yourself and say you were late for dinner we had company I was so embarrassed you can say that but you can say that in proportion to you know what the problem really is all right so I'll show you how to do that 
You'll find that if you can control emotions before they get intense, so starting early, you may have this little window of opportunity to do that. You can avoid a lot of problems that come from overreactions and overwhelm, and it's easier to get back to a calm and regulated state than so I have a friend who visualizes emotional dysregulation as an airplane taking off. You may have heard me talk about that. And regulating her emotions is what she calls keeping the airplane on the ground. And I love that. That is what it feels like. Cause yeah. <laughs> and so you can think of that too. How are you going to keep your airplane on the ground once it takes off? You know, it's just a great big deal. <laughs> so how are you going to do that? You can do it. You can stay regulated even when you're upset if you understand what's happening and you practice, practice, practice. So when you go into a strong emotional reaction, one is notice it's happening. Are you flooding with emotion? Are you feeling adrenaline? Are you panicking? Are you starting to cry? So say to yourself, I'm having an emotional reaction because it's just true. You can just say that to yourself. Just ground yourself in reality with that. Ah, I'm having an emotional reaction. So another thing you can do is slow down the interaction. Just get it way slowed down. A lot of us are very sensitive to hurrying. And yet once we start panicking, we start rushing. So it sort of compounds itself. So you can just back up, take big pauses between what is said. Take your time to answer. Take your time to say things. Consider your words. Prepare to see things in a new way. Now, a lot of the time, simply slowing things down can reduce the overwhelm. That's all that's needed. Less overwhelm means you can recover your perspective right there and then and experience a little calming effect inside. If you're about to cry and you don't want to cry because you're at work or you're giving a speech or you don't want to be vulnerable in a particular situation, here's a great trick. Imagine that on your stomach, like right below your belly button, that you have a knob. All right. And the knob goes all the way up to 10 or 11. If you like spinal tap, <laughs> if you have emotional dysregulation, it definitely goes to at least 11. All right. So now imagine that the tears are coming because you accidentally left the knob at about eight. So now just in your mind, dial your belly knob just down to two, just bring it down to two. And that's sometimes that's all that's needed to just like just stop the tears, control the tears and the sadness. It is like somebody left a gate open or something and the cows are running out. So you just shut the gate or bring it down to two. You're not cutting off your emotions 100%, but just controlling the opening there. All right. If it's anger that's happening, use what used to be called restraint of pen and tongue. That's a really nice phrase. I use it all the time. It's so helpful to me. And it means don't say anything or write anything, including emails, texts, letters. Don't do it when you're angry. What happens is this venting will escalate your emotional overwhelm and your thinking gets distorted and you might say things you don't actually believe and that you'll regret. And of course, when, if you've ever had a conflict over text, it never goes well. There's no way to communicate the tenderness or the caring or the listening. It just sounds like somebody's snapping no matter how you handle it. So don't do that. When you're angry, don't write. Instead, because it's important to express yourself, Promise yourself that you'll express yourself just a little later when you're calm. You can find a gentle, polite way to postpone any more conversation. You can just say, I really want to have this conversation. It's important to me. I, I definitely don't want to, you know, get all intense on you. Could I just have 15 minutes so I can, you know, just bring my emotions together? You don't even have to say that if you're at work. You can just say, you know what? I have this other call. I need to go do that. Can I come back and have this conversation? with you in 15 minutes. So whether you choose to tell anybody that you're taking time out to emotionally re-regulate or not, people will generally accept that you can continue the conversation later. And whether they realize <laughs> what was about to happen or not, it's good for everybody for you to show up kind of regulated for all your conversations. It's just, it's good for you. It's good for them. If it feels urgent for you to express yourself, that is often a cue that you need to take double time pausing and getting re-regulated. The sense of urgency is not always reliable with CPTSD. It's, it's basically your old like emergency response kicking in over stuff that's just about communication or saying how you feel. So it, when it really is an emergency, if you need to pull somebody out of a rushing river or you're in an abusive situation and you need to get out the door, of course, urgency is appropriate. But if it's just about communicating something or trying to talk something through, if you feel urgency, 
it's very likely going to only benefit if you pause for 30 minutes or an hour or tomorrow. There's very little that has to be solved like in, in any given day that's important. So if you can come back regulated in more time, that's really good. Don't underestimate the damage you can do when you, when you try to uh, uh, solve problems when you're dysregulated. It's kind of like driving drunk, okay? All right, another thing you can do, do some emergency writing. And I'm talking about the daily practice way of writing that I teach. I have a free course. I always link it on the free tools page of my website. The free tools page of my website is always linked down in the description section below. But it's called the daily practice. And I teach a specific technique where you can get your fearful and resentful thoughts on paper, kind of ask for them to be removed, rest your mind. Give it a try. Um, so many of us have had it experience life-changing um, healing from being able to put our emotions on paper before just kind of throwing them at another person. It often feels, especially if you were neglected as a kid, that what you really, really need is to tell somebody how much they hurt you. Because there's this fantasy that if you tell them, then they'll be like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'll come in and I'll care for you and I'll help you feel better. But A, in adult life, that's usually not how people respond when we come come at them like in, in anger. They don't respond like trying to help us. And if they do, it's probably not coming from a healthy place. But also, it's not realistic that other people can, even if they want to, that they can re-regulate your nervous system. It is an inside job. So, so we take those feelings to the paper and have a process for relieving them before having the communication. We do need communication, but it, it when it's packed up with like all your unmet childhood needs, it becomes it becomes something quite frightening and overwhelming to other people. They're either going to run or they're going to pretend, but it's going to be a disappointment and it's going to hurt your relationship. So paper, that's, that's a suggestion there. What I love about paper, you can do this just about anywhere in the bathroom. You can do it in the dark of a movie theater. You can do it in the car when you're a passenger, not driving, obviously. You can do it in bed in the middle of the night. You can do it at your desk while you're pretending to work. And employers, I'm an employer too. <laughs> But here's the thing, I, I'm not saying that you should just fake work and steal time from your employer like that, but sometimes the most efficient way to get productive in your day is to take the overwhelming emotions and just get them out on paper so that you can return your focus back to the task at hand. That's a good thing to do. It's definitely better than having an emotional meltdown too. All right, another thing you can do is get some hard exercise to kind of like rinse all those stress chemicals out of your body. You can run up and down a flight of stairs a couple of times if you are physically able to do that. If you can walk, you can take a brisk walk. Whatever you physically can do to get your heart rate up, maybe just break a little bit of a sweat. It just is so powerful to turn around the stress chemicals that are active when you're in, a, in emotional dysregulation. And sometimes, sometimes you can come at emotional dysregulation through reason. Sometimes you have to come at it through physical action. Um, there are a number of ways that you, can, that you can approach your healing. So I'm giving you a list of them so you can find your favorites. All right, here's one. This is another physical one. You can wash your hands or in a big pinch, you can take a shower. Wash your hands in cold water, splash it on your face. Everybody does that, right, sometimes? Or wash your hands in nice, warm, soapy water that feels nice and take just take a minute to feel the water on your hands and the soap and the clean hands and feel how nice that is. You're using these tactile experiences to just sort of come back from this sort of flight away from what's actually happening for your senses right here in the room for you right now. You, you, it, this is called being in your body. And I don't actually believe that people leave their bodies, but that's a metaphor for what it happens when our nervous system is starting to shut down, like quadrants of your brain are just going dim and you're not able to process sensory input from where you are. And that's when you're often vulnerable to you know, outbursts or saying things you don't mean. You want to be in touch with all of your feelings. You want to be in touch with cues. You want to be able to detect danger. Like if you're going up and shouting at somebody on the street, what if they're dangerous? What if they could physically harm you? You need to be tuned in, right? And so that's, that's why physical, at physical regulation, neurological regulation goes hand in hand with emotional regulation. So we're learning to master re-regulation of both. It all comes down together and you begin to be centered in a calm awareness. And you're just, you have nice ears to hear what's going on. You have eyes, 
You have a heart to feel what's going on. And imagine like if you could do that, that would change a lot, right? So emotional dysregulation feels to me, and I think a lot of people, a little bit like a trance, like you're hypnotized. You're a little bit out of touch with some things. You're deeply in touch with, with something else, a feeling. And what, what you need to develop is to have part of you that can sort of stand outside that situation and go, I see that I'm going into a trance-like dysregulation state. And that part of you that can see it's going on can kind of take you gently by the shoulders and say, hey, come on, Anna come on out, let's get out of this dysregulated state. Let's use some tools. Once you have that part of you that can sort of pull you back a little bit when you notice it's happening, you've just gotten on the path to serious change. That's how you do it. Self-awareness, just enough to pull back. Before you know what to do, before you've solved all your problems, you're just like, okay, this thing is happening. I know it doesn't go well when I you know, say things and try to solve problems like this. Let me take a beat, all right? If you like, you can talk with somebody who is trustworthy, they understand you, and who's not in that moment in a conflict with you, very important, someone else. Sometimes it helps to get an outside perspective, but I don't recommend trying to tell a long story. I don't recommend trying to vent, going into yet another hypnotic trance, and then he did this, and then he did that, and then, ah, ah, you know, have you done that? I've done it. That's bad, that just takes me worse into emotional dysregulation. So the, the discussion, it doesn't usually work that well when you're already upset, but obviously sometimes this can't be avoided and somebody will try to help you and assist you to kind of emotionally calm it. The irony is that one of the hardest things for a person in dysregul emotional dysregulation to hear is, can you calm down? <laughs> Ma'am, please calm down. It's like, Woo, you know, it goes off again. So sometimes it's going to be you by yourself. So one way to check in with yourself when you're having one of those conversations is to ask yourself, is having this conversation making you more dysregulated? Are you feeling more upset? Are you maybe talking faster and faster, louder and louder? Are you talking on top of people? These are signs that you're actually going into dysregulation. So if you can have that part of you stand outside and go, oops, I'm getting more dysregulated. You just find a polite way to say, okay, well, thanks for your help. Now get yourself to a private space with your pen and pencil or your tools, your physical tools, to start bringing yourself back before you begin talking again. Talking is sometimes the gateway drug to more dysregulation, just saying. Sometimes it's useful, sometimes it's not. We need to learn the difference because when we're dysregulated, the person we're getting all dysregulated on will often also dysregulate, and two dysregulating, dysregulated people will often escalate quite badly. You've probably been there. Everything that needs to be said can and should be said, but not necessarily in that moment. If you possibly can, wait until you're regulated, calm, more lucid, able to feel the range of feelings you have about someone and, and not just the angry part, not frantically trying to get them to understand something. These steps, by the way, don't just help you regulate emotionally, but they help you re-regulate your brain and in your body, your heart rate, your breathing, your thinking, your coordination of your you know, feet and hands, your ability to focus. So I have a quiz you can take to, if you wanna check some of the symptoms of dysregulation. If you're hearing this and you're like, wait, that happens to me. I got a list of them and you can check them off on this list. That is in my free tools page too that I mentioned on my website, free tools. The link to the free tools page is down below in the description section. When you're re-regulating your emotions and the intense thoughts keep just fluttering in, just keep reminding yourself to hold the thought and instead focus on next steps, positive actions, positive words. This isn't positive thinking. It's not toxic positivity. This is just redirecting your thoughts when they're sort of going whack to a clearer mental space because that's part of you too. You have clarity in there. You have a place in there that, is, that has less emotional charge where you can anchor yourself, you can remind yourself, that's your home. That's, that's, that's where you go when things get crazy is into this, this home inside. You're not suppressing your feelings, you're just postponing expressing your feelings until you're a little more regulated. And contrary to popular belief, by the way, you don't have to talk things out to get regulated. Talking about your feelings, it's important, but there's a time and a place and sometimes that best time and place is later when it will be helpful and constructive and when it will help you have and keep and strengthen relationships with people you love, people you treasure, even though it doesn't feel like that when you're emotionally dysregulated. So when this happens, just keep reminding yourself by silently telling yourself, I'm feeling dysregulated, and then use your tools 
Stop venting. Remind yourself that you don't need to express yourself and clear the air right then. Your words will be there. Your feelings will be there waiting for you when you're calmer. You will have access to yourself. You'll be no longer dysregulated. And then when you express yourself, you can do it elegantly and with fairness and love. It'll feel great to keep your relationship gentle like this and to get past the shame of overreactions. And then you can enjoy the way that your connections with other people, rather than getting ruined, begin to get nicer, deeper, stronger over time. Today, I want to talk about what you will notice in yourself when these wonderful changes are taking place. This is the most important part of what I'm teaching. And I go over these signs every so often to make sure that you and everyone who watches my videos gets to hear them so that they can be like a beacon for you. They can be a light that you follow when you're in a dark period of your life. Let these signs of healing be like a North star for you and go in that direction. Okay. Now you've heard me talk about all the self-defeating behaviors that are common for people with CPTSD. These are the things we struggle to stop doing at first that can re-traumatize us. They take the old childhood traumas and activate them again. If you haven't seen the video where I go through some of those, I'll put a link at the end of this video. So stay with me for that part. What I'm going to tell you now is what it looks like when those trauma driven habits fall away, which they will. Now, maybe you're at the point or maybe you're not there yet. There's not time in my video to, you know, cover everything that I teach in my programs, but I want to plant legitimate hope in your heart that you can and should look forward to healing these common ways that people with childhood PTSD re-traumatize themselves. We do this. And I teach this because for me, this was the hardest part of healing. And I mean, yes, the stuff that happened to me when I was a child was bad. But in the end, it was the stuff I did to myself, the bad relationships, the uh, chain smoking, lashing out at people. You know, if you've taken my courses, you know my story, but I wasn't getting better for a really long time when I was trying to get better because of all the hurtful situations I was putting myself into and dragging other people into. And then I changed. And it's not like I'm all perfect now. I'm a work in progress, just like everyone. But if you're stuck in a pattern, just like I was, I get it. I understand. And I'm here to show you a better way. Okay. So you want to hear some of the signs when you're healed from traumatizing yourself anymore. Okay. You're not going to have all of these, but you can see if you relate to some of them. One is when your trauma is healing, you will no longer tend to see things in black and white terms, people, yourself, situations, you will no longer hold them up as all good or put them down as all bad. And you'll begin to appreciate the complexity of things and the way people can have faults, but still be decent people anyway. And you'll have less outrage and more curiosity about other points of view. You'll have less impatience and more persistence, and you'll lose the attraction to extreme views or authority figures and gain the ability to interact with a variety of people and educate yourself. And relationships where one person dominates will become more equal uh, or they'll fade away <laughs> and it will be less necessary to cut people out of your life. So think of all the struggle you've had in the past around these problems and how good it will feel to be free. Number two is you'll have a natural desire to care for your body. And part of it is because you'll have less drama and more energy to do things like take a walk, floss your teeth or shop for clothes that actually look good on you. And you'll feel a little better. And so now when you're feeling too schlumpy to leave the house or you're, t or you're tired from watching TV till after midnight, it's going to feel not worth it anymore. It will become more possible to face your addictions and to take action so that you overcome them. One little step after another will lead to more clarity, more enthusiasm for life, and you'll want to do more good things for yourself. It feeds on itself. All right. Number three is, this is another one where an old behavior will start to just feel awful. And that's around the way that you eat. Being at the effect of past trauma can lead to everything from obesity and eating disorders to a tendency to deal with stress by binging on high carbohydrate foods and sugar um, or not eating at all. Now the high carb foods 
can be calming at first, but dysregulating in the long run. And as you heal, you're not gonna want that feeling. And in fact, if sugar and carbs are your weak spot, they are mine, you might wanna check out Brightline Eating. I've got a link to that down below in the description section for anybody who wants to find it. It's a nice way of eating that's very flexible and I find really helps with dysregulation. Number four is you'll lose that compulsive desire to binge on TV and video games and just plain looking at your phone all the time. And if you're someone who has been into that stuff enough to interfere with your sleep or meals or your job performance or your ability to be present with the people in your life, then the release from screen addiction is going to be life changing for you. And I know I have to look at a screen to say this to you and you have to look at a screen to hear it but everything in moderation, all right? Number five, you'll notice this big sign that you're not re-traumatizing yourself anymore when you aren't tempted anymore to fudge the truth. This is things like exaggerating, hiding important information about yourself, or even lying about things. And part of the reason is there will be nothing that you need to hide or feel ashamed about you won't have so many problems when you've healed from your trauma. So you'll be comfortable being more honest about what's going on in your life. But it's also because just being real, being honestly yourself, it feels better. And you'll start to have discomfort. You know, it just doesn't feel good when you're not being real. You'll actually want the truth to filter through your life. And if there's anyone still in your life who can't handle who you really are and how you really feel, then that's okay. Maybe they're not meant to be there. And maybe when they're gone, even though saying goodbye will be sad, there's gonna be a big, nice space where someone who loves you and accepts you just as you are can be. All right, number six, an important sign that you're healing from trauma is that your work life will start to go better. You won't stay stuck in unfulfilling work. You're gonna change your relationship to that job or get a new one. And if a lack of work has been your problem, all the good changes happening will make it easier to get work and earn money that supports you and all the people who count on you. Now you'll know how to steer clear of exploitative or abusive employers. You'll lose your appetite for conflicts on the job and you'll gain the ability to show up, do good work, be an encourager of your coworkers and an advocate for yourself and your ideas when you need to. All right, the seventh sign that you're done re-traumatizing yourself is that you'll lose interest in assigning blame to yourself or other people for problems and instead focus on finding good solutions. You'll feel less angry, less irritable, and when something is your fault, it'll be easier to just own it and apologize. And when someone else owes you an apology, but they don't give it to you, <laughs> you won't dwell on it. Blamey news and social media also, it's just those posts are just gonna start to put a bad taste in your mouth. And people in your life may not know why, but they're gonna feel better around themselves when they're around you. Number eight, a big sign that your trauma is really healing now is that any attraction you once had to unavailable partners and troubling friends will let go of you. I talk a lot about this in all my videos about healing relationships, but so much life damage is done by this one self-defeating behavior, connecting and bonding with and staying with people who are trouble or avoiding any kind of intimacy with people at all, even though it's what you long for. Or you might be abusing intimacy by acting out sexually, which is still a way of having no intimacy. Now this is one part of CPTSD that can be hard to heal just by deciding to change. It cuts to the very heart of that trauma wound. But when you've made real progress in other areas, it'll be easier to stop re-traumatizing yourself in the area of your life where sex and romance are. The spell gets broken and there is peace when you're single and the possibility of harmony and real love when you do meet someone. The ninth sign is this, you start to prefer reality to fantasy and the tendency to check out by spending too much time in a limerent fantasy romance or in a fantastical business idea, picture that you're dreaming about but not acting on. And this is really common for people who are going through a trauma right now. But after time, it's just another way to avoid real problems and the actions that you need to take to solve them and move forward. 
Now, when you're healing, it feels less necessary to fantasize. And when you catch yourself daydreaming, you can come back where you can actually connect with people and put your goals into action, which is here and now. That's a good thing. And finally, number 10, your material well-being starts to come together in a positive way. Most people in the world, including most happy people, live good lives without being rich and famous, and some live on very little money at all. Financial hardship can fall on anyone, but when you're free of trauma, it's more possible to earn a steady income, to let go of, you know, get rich quick schemes, to live within your means, to release the fear of the past when maybe you were always a few hundred dollars away from homelessness. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been there before and it can limit you. It all gets better all together at the same time, a little here, a little there. And when you're healing all this stuff, you can sleep at night, you can handle hard days, you can hold your head up even though you make mistakes because you're not sabotaging yourself in ways that make you ashamed. This is what healing feels like when you're not re-traumatized all the time. 